we're still early days. It reminds me, it feels like we're like 1997, 98 with the internet. And so I think a lot is going to change in the coming years. And the more that sponsors can get their head around this and see that this is the future, that the more use cases we're going to start seeing. This is your daily real estate syndication show. I'm your host, Whitney Sewell. And today we're back with our guest, Joshua Kagan. He's a co-founder, CEO of Bonfire, and he's on a mission to democratize access to real estate. Bonfire transforms income producing assets into tokens, right? And, and he goes into depth or he went in depth yesterday, but we're going to talk about it a little more about what is tokenization and what is blockchain, some of those things. But he wants a way to allow everyday folks like you and me to participate in property ownership, right? There, that we may never have the opportunity. And so you're going to hear us dive more in today and we'll focus more on the sponsor, but every bit of this relates to the passive investor as well. Thank you for being back with us again today. We've got Joshua back. We're diving back into tokenizing real estate. Can you really do that, right? Well, he's done that. He's doing that. They're helping us as sponsors to do just that. And we're going to dive back into that today. I want to remind you to go and listen to yesterday's episode where you're going to learn a little more about Josh, his background, and what tokenization even means versus blockchain versus crypto. I think if you're in this space, almost in any space, you need to know at least that, right? Before we dive into some of the things we're going to talk about today or even as you're thinking about and how is blockchain or tokenizing, tokenization, all those terms, how is that going to affect us in the future? Like you should be familiar with that, especially in our space. But I want to jump into, or at first, Joshua, welcome back to the show. Thank you, Whitney. It's great to be here. Great to be back. Thanks. Yeah. Honored to continue our discussion in, in related to Bonfire and just what you're doing there, right? Token, tokenizing real estate. I wanted to think in terms of the sponsor and in some of this, just so the listener knows, I mean, it's going to relate to the past investor as well, right? Because I'm going to have questions for something like this as an operator that's specifically related to my investors, right? Because that, that, that's who we're doing all this for. And, you know, it's kind of our backbone, right? Or it's a major partnership there. So and as we would consider looking at something like Bonfire for our deals, well, I'm going to ask questions on behalf of my investors, right? So I just want the listeners to know that I'm sure we'll be going back and forth there a little bit. But as far, as far as, let's just start with why should sponsors, you know, tokenize their offerings? Why should they be considering that now? Yeah, and we'll dive in there. I would say that the biggest draw of, of tokenization, there's kind of two. The first is access to new forms of capital in the capital stack. So we as a platform can facilitate international, domestic, accredited, unaccredited investors. It's like some sponsors don't want unaccredited in their capital stack, and that's fine too. But we, it's on Bonfire to source this kind of global network of small investors, pull it into one LLC that goes on the capital stack for the sponsor. So they're only ever dealing with, with, with a managing partner of the LLC, right? And so we do it in a completely compliant manner with the SEC, et cetera. And we don't charge the sponsor anything. Right. And I know that there's other platforms that have like percent listing fee or this or that. We charge them nothing. So there's really zero risk of putting a deal on Bonfire's platform because we'll be able to know within three days whether our community wants to fund it or not. And with capital markets drying up right now, debt markets are pretty dry from relative to six months ago. And um, investors, equity investors getting a little skittish about the state of the market and the economy, being able to diversify one's pool of investors is this prudent business sense, right? The second benefit to sponsors, and it will, it will have dependent, you know, some sponsors, this will be a benefit for some, it won't, is the potential to have liquidity for the LPs. And there's a lot of complexity and detail around that. But for some sponsors um, that we're speaking with, you know, they have, L it's awkward for them, but, you know, from time to time, LPs will call them up and say, hey, I really need to get out because I'm getting a divorce or this thing is happening and I need the money. And the sponsor's like, dude, I, what am I supposed to tell you? Like you're in the deal. And then the sponsor ends up buying them out for pennies on the dollar. And it's just an awkward dynamic. By tokenizing it, you know, there's the potential for liquidity within that LP, uh, LLC interest. Yeah, that's interesting. The yeah, as we move, we, and just so the listener knows, in case you didn't listen yesterday, Joshua spoke to the liquidity piece to some extent during yesterday's episode. And so 
That's interesting. You mentioned, because I was going to ask about fees the sponsor should expect, but you said there, there's no charge. Is that right? There's no charge to the sponsor. Correct. Um, we do charge our members of, an, of our LLC a technology access fee. That's not a percentage of the raise. It's a fixed fee. And yeah, that, that's the main cost to our members of, of the LLC. You know, what are some other things a sponsor should consider before tokenizing a piece of real estate? And then I'd love to get into uh, specific kinds of real estate and maybe some success stories as well. But, uh, but why should they even consider it? Yeah. Or, or things they should consider that they wouldn't know to even think of. So the first thing is going to be, what are they tokenizing? Is it an asset? Is it a series of assets? Is it a fund? What is the goal of the sponsor for the transaction in general? What, what are they trying to do? And, what, and once they've clarified that, well, how are they planning on raising capital? Is it through a self-issuance, of like a Reg D offering, whether it's 506B or C? Um, are they open to accredited, unaccredited investors or is it only accredited, right? So understanding sort of those basic blocks will help inform the tokenization strategy because we have flexibility whether we could have a credit, unaccredited, international, domestic. So that's where it would begin, how much they're looking to raise, et cetera. And then we'd come in and we'd say, great, it looks like an awesome project. Let, let us tokenize an allocation of it. And what that means is we go out to our investor group and we say, hey, this is the project. Um, here's some information about it. Maybe we do a webinar with the sponsor. Maybe we don't. And then basically our members come together and they submit their commitments for it. They sign a binding off agreement. They wire money into an escrow account. And then that money gets goes from the escrow account to the sponsor. And the sponsor, let me just clarify, the sponsor gets US dollars, right? So whether our members pay with with Ethereum, which is a crypto, and we have other cryptos that people can buy with, or dollars, or wire, or ACH. Regardless, that's turning into dollars for the sponsor. And as mentioned earlier, we don't charge the sponsors anything for this. Wow. Okay. Yeah, it's interesting. What about, who have you seen be the most successful? I mean, when I talk about that, I'm meaning the structure of the deal, 506C, B, open to accredited, those types of things. Anything that you've seen, or even the types of real estate that you all have seen, uh, to be most successful on your platform? It's a great question because we're still early days. It reminds me, it feels like we're like 1997, 98 with the internet, you know? And so I think a lot is going to change in the coming years. And the more that sponsors can get their head around this and see that this is the future, that the more use cases we're going to start seeing. But what I would say is, without going to speaking too much, there's big trade-offs between 506B and C. C is the easiest to do general solicitation where a sponsor can blast the deal out to the world, but you can only have accredited investors and those accredited investors have to do submit documentation showing that they're accredited, right? Whether it's tax forms or getting an accountant or a lawyer to attest that they're accredited. 506B is a lot, well, it's a lot easier in the sense that accredited, accredited investors only have to just check a box and say, oh, I'm accredited. But the minute you have an unaccredited investor in the 506B, you know, you have to basically create a PPM that has disclosure levels akin to being a publicly traded company, right? And you have to, and we as Bonfire or anyone who's dealing with unaccredited have to determine that they have the knowledge to be able to, and the skill set of capacity to evaluate the investment and this sophistication of sorts. There's a new, um, a newish method of raising capital from unaccredited. It's called Regulation CF. If folks have heard of that before, it was passed under Obama under the, something called the Jobs Act, and that enables for an unlimited number of unaccredited. But we, as a back end, have to do go through a lot of hoops to be in compliance and make sure that these folks are only investing a certain percentage of their net worth and all that stuff. And that's what Bonfire and our partners do. The, the sponsor never has to worry about that. It's more of a question of, you know, is the spon what is the sponsor specific strategy and are they flexible with different types of investors coming into the deal? I think in the last episode, you mentioned they could be, there could be a, say a $2,000 minimum, right? It made me think about, you know, who sets that minimum? Is that the operator? Is it you all? And I was thinking through, so there's a conversation in our organization now about our minimum, raising that from say 50,000 to a hundred or. And I know a lot of operators who have gone from, say, 25, and now they're at 250000 for a minimum. And so I, I was thinking about how that would work if using a platform like this. Who sets that minimum on your platform? 
and then how that would work in, in conjunction if we have a higher minimum and you all have a lower minimum, right? Yeah, and we just dealt with that with this hotel project in Marin County, California, 20 minutes north of San Francisco, where the sponsor, and I don't remember off the top of my head what, what the minimum was on this deal, um, maybe fifty, maybe $100,000 ish, definitely wasn't 2000. Um, but from the sponsor's perspective, bonfires, just, it's just one check, right? That's coming to that, to their capital table, the cap table. Like, so they're not having to deal with, they're going to give us one K1 and it's, uh, it's incumbent upon bonfire to make the distributions and the K1s to our community. Right. And they're shielded from those members because of the, you know, the operating agreement that really specifies that we are our own LLC. We are dealing with our members, right? Like they are completely shielded from the specific LPs within the LP. Right? So the sponsor never has to deal with our 50 or on one deal, we had 150 people on the deal. They never have to deal with that. That's on us. And we take that headache away from the sponsor. Nice. What about how, how communication works? I know that's a question I would want to know because my investors are going to want to know that. If somebody, how does communication work, I guess, from the sponsor about the deal to bonfire to the investors? What does that process look like? Yeah. Well, so far we've worked with sponsors that we have good relationships with and we can, we can if something were to happen, I feel very confident that they, they would pick up the phone and we'd have a conversation. But we have an expectation of quarterly correspondence, like my email of just kind of how the project's going, um, just any material updates. Um, and then we communicate that to our investor group. And, it, and it's an open conversation with our, our members around what is the best form of communication within our group. Like someone, had, it, 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 we're on this platform called Discord. We have 3,000 people on it. It's sort of a, if you're under 30 Discord, and if you're over 30, it's really this complicated thing. And anyways, what Discord enables us to have is a one-on-one -on -one relationship with our customers. And so I do a lot of video chats with our customers. And someone would like, it'd be really helpful to have a quarterly call with Bonfire, not with the sponsor. We won't burden the sponsor with this, but just to understand, just to learn more about the project and real estate in general. And I said, that's a cool idea. You know, we could do a quarterly webinar or just have more engagement around how real estate works and any updates on the project. That's fine. Um, I don't know if that's scalable long term. You know, in the early days of the company, you do things that don't scale and stay close to your customers. Yeah, as long as the sponsor is giving us quarterly updates, we're, we're happy. And what about, uh, I guess, what's your ideal? Uh, and we briefly talked about this, but is there an ideal asset class? Is there an ideal business plan? Maybe exit strategy, you know, those things that work best for bonfire tokenizing the real estate. We're still figuring out exactly what, what our members want um, because there's different levers we can pull, right? Cash flow is one, appreciation is another, tax benefits, risk, right? Those are kind of the four different aspects of the quadrant, if you will. We're finding that our members have less appetite for just ground up new construction right now, just given the macro cycle we're in right now. We're not seeing a ton of interest in office, shockingly enough. Um, I would say our sweet spot right now are like this hotel project had a distressed element to it, but it's a repositioning project. But it's very, we were buying it at like an 8.9 cap and it was already cash flowing and there was things about it that made it a home run deal that just got us very excited. So being able to tell a story of why this asset should outperform an alternative one and have either a, a decent return three to five years of an exit or like oh, we're looking at one right now um, that's a single tent, triple net lease, big box out of the East Coast. Very successful developer who's worked with this name brand chain for the last about eight, nine years. And this developer, they're, they're doing a lot of projects with this very credit worthy name brand, big box company. And so he's looking for basically pref equity, like a, like a, like a second of 14% that's how's the credit worthiness of this really good tenant. And our members are showing interest in that deal. That's a very different one than a hotel repositioning project that's going from a two-star four points to a four four-star Marriott. And we're looking at 22% like of ours, but that's going to take three years, right? So we're still figuring out what is that sweet spot. And, and the great thing about our platform is we're nimble and we can be very quick. And with the right deal, we can float into 
our network and see pretty quickly, is there interest or not, and not waste a bunch of people's time. So I know that doesn't exactly answer your question, like, or are we all in on hotels? or No, or that's helpful, though. Yeah. Yeah, it's that key, that's, it could save so much time and money, energy right there, just because you can float it to the platform and get a feel for it before you, you put too much behind it, right? Uh, or too much marketing dollars. Well, how do you all market a deal to your platform? So right now it's word of mouth. Our wait list is growing by five to 10 people every day. We put out some content on, on Twitter, on Discord, on LinkedIn. We can't advertise specific deals on these platforms yet. We're, we're just, you know, we're doing a lot of webinars and podcasts and we just have this growing, I'm very fortunate when I mean, my family comes from real estate, I've spent the last 12, 13 years in this sort of real estate tech capital markets. Like we, we have a nice database of folks who want to hear from us and that's growing every single day. And so far we've intentionally not done any paid advertising whatsoever because we want to figure out what is it about our platform resonates with folks. And really do a lot of sort of A-B testing and experimenting with messaging to see, oh, this is what people want to hear from us about, not this other thing. And once we have a better sense of what that is, then we will we'll, we'll advertise. But for now, it's all organic. What about timelines for doing a deal? How much time do you all need as far as getting the deal on the platform and you all doing your due diligence? Yeah, so we can get a deal on our platform very quickly. It kind of depends on the sponsor. And what I mean by that is like the sponsor from the whole uh, the Hawaii deal, the Marin deal, he had a buttoned up OM and PPM and stuff that he gave us, right? Now I'm talking with someone who has a really interesting industrial project in South Los Angeles, and he has a number of bullets, right? And so it, it kind of depends on where the sponsor is in the, and how much information they have for us to be able to underwrite it and get materials and photos on our platform. So if we have a buttoned up PPM and OM and we have confidence in the sponsor and the deal, I mean, we can get it up in four hours. My, my co-founder is extremely fast when it comes to tech, not our tech team. So we can get it up quickly. We can get an email out in a day. Um, it's just really a matter of like, how far along is the sponsor and are they ready to, to move? Awesome. Well, let's move to a few final questions, Joshua, what would you say is your best advice for passive investors right now? Oh, man. I would say to continue to educate yourself and learn as much as possible. Listen to this podcast, read books, reach out directly to people that you, you know, that if you have a question about something, ask it, right? There's no such thing as dumb questions. And with real estate, with with emerging technology, with finance, some of this stuff is is pretty jargon heavy and complicated. And just keep asking questions until you feel comfortable. And there's no need to do a deal or invest at any time, right? Do it feel when you feel confident and comfortable is what my advice would be. What are some of the most important metrics that you track? It could be personally or per, or professionally. You mean in my personal life or bonfire or... Yeah, so I, I usually say it could be how many mornings you get out of bed on time, your bench press number, how, how much weight you're lifting in the gym, or it could be how many deals you all are analyzing or I don't know how many team members you're hiring. It could be anything in between, whatever some of the most important metrics are to you. My personal ones, and this might be too much information, is, you know, did I meditate 15 minutes? Did I exercise? How much caffeine or alcohol did I drink? Reflecting on a daily basis, like, was I a kind human being today or was I an a-hole, right? And what can I learn from today? I try to do that on a daily basis and just look at you know, self-care and things of that nature. Um, with Bonfire, I'm looking at, oh, what was our, yeah, how was our wait list growing? What's our engagement on our platform looking like? What's our SEO looking like? How are people coming to our site? How long are they spending? Where are they spending time on? When we put out a piece of content on, on Twitter and we test out messaging, what's our engagement looking like? Are people like, are they not? Things of that nature. Like how many, how many calls do I have with customers this week is actually a really important one for me because I never want to build something as a co-founder that isn't adding tremendous value to other people's lives. And at the end of the day, the goal for me is not to be the richest person in the cemetery. It's to help 
millions of people get on the property ownership ladder. And why that matters is because for most of us, the biggest asset we'll ever have in our lives is the house we live in, the house we own. And a lot of people are not going to be able to own houses in the coming years because of structural things that we talked about earlier around student debt, et cetera. And yet the ability to own real estate and have compounded growth that's levered is the surest, safest way to generate wealth. And we at Bonfire want to help millions of people get off that sort of, you know, rat the cycle of just living subsistently and, and paycheck to paycheck to actually owning assets. And what comes from, from a Maslow's hierarchy of needs, what comes from actually having wealth and the choices that people get to make and just the lives that they get to live, we feel like that should be available to all. And we want to be that platform that facilitates that. I always ask at the end how people like to give back. You pretty much just answered that, but I'll still ask you if there's anything else you'd like to add as far as how you like to give back. One of the ways I like to give back is working with young entrepreneurs who are trying to solve intractable social problems, but using market-based forces. I'm a big believer that the markets, if done, if used in the right way, can, can solve every, pretty much every problem. And so I get really excited working with people who are right out of college or graduate school or wherever who are like, you know what, I want to solve this problem. And I want to just, I want to figure out how to not make maybe mistakes that other young entrepreneurs have made. And so there's a number of startups I advise and founders I advise. And I just love doing that. Um, it keeps me fresh. It keeps me connected to a younger generation and just looking at the world differently than how I might otherwise. Nice. Joshua, it's been a Honored to get to meet you and have you on the show to learn more about Bonfire, but really to dive in and open the eyes maybe for sponsors and passive investors who are listening that, that need to understand this is coming, right? It's going to be a thing. It is a thing already. And it's going to be a, a way, it's like you mentioned, for them to gain more liquidity and maybe even uh, do smaller investments in more deals and more diversification. And, you know, there's going to be many benefits, even the tracking of the blockchain system, like you talked about er earlier in yesterday's episode, and just the ability to be able to trust that system and how that functions. So it's so trustworthy. So grateful for your time. I uh, share with the listeners again how they can get in touch with you and learn more about you and Bonfire. Absolutely. By the way, Whitney, thank you so much for having me. I really enjoyed our conversations over the last two days. I'm very accessible. Joshua at bonfire.capital is my personal email. www.bonfire.capital is our URL. You can find me on LinkedIn. Just type in Joshua Kagan or Twitter, Joshua Kagan, I think one. I'm around, so feel free to reach out anytime. Thank you for being with us again today. I hope that you have learned a lot from the show. Don't forget to like and subscribe. I hope you're telling your friends about the Real Estate Syndication Show and how they can also build wealth in real estate. You can also go to lifebridgecapital.com and start investing today.